Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 10th, 2015. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, Chris Colby from BeerAndWineJournal.com and I talk about brewing triples. This Trappist-inspired style is light in color, very tasty, and one of my favorites. The ingredient list is simple, but fermentation is where you need to pay a bit of attention. If you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And if you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. We have a Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing video page on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. We're on the Google Plus as well. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. You know how that works. Whenever you think of Amazon shopping, think of us first and click on our associate link on the right-hand side of our basicbrewing.com page. It'll take you back to Amazon where you can shop as you normally do. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping us to bring you the show. We greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Home Brewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes, our Android app on Amazon.com. We have a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory, and we're on the Stitcher app as well. If you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some coinage in our guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support, and thanks to everybody who's done so already. Uh, if you listened last week and are follow me, following me on uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, you know that I'm in the process of brewing an Oktoberfest, or at least my take on an Oktoberfest, for a gathering on October 17th. And uh, I racked a secondary on Monday and got a, a, a bit of a surprise. Um, this is a 100% a Vienna beer, 100% Vienna malt, uh, the first that I've done. And the fermentability was a lot lower than I expected. Uh, Vienna is kilned to be darker than most base malts, but it, it still has enough enzymatic activity to convert in the mash. Uh, the fermentation looked great. The yeast was very happy, uh, but after you know a couple, three days, I, I uh, brought it out of the uh, kegerator where it was at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I let it warm up to do a diacetyl rest. Uh, so I, I don't think the Oktoberfest yeast got stuck in any way. Uh, the beer tastes good, but it's a, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it an accidental session beer because <laughs> it just didn't ferment out like, uh, like, I, thought it, uh, like I thought it should. Um, the beer is now in secondary in a, in a carboy in the kegerator, and I'm ramping the temperature down uh, before putting it into the keg and... Um, I'm just wondering if you've done 100% Vienna malt beers and what your experience has been. Maybe maybe I should have done a step mash with a lower initial rest temperature to bring up the fermentability a bit. I'll keep you posted. It doesn't taste too sweet. It tastes nice and malty, uh, but it's a it's fairly well balanced, and so I don't, it's not syrupy by any uh, stretch of the imagination. So I still think it's going to be a tasty beer, especially after it's carbonated in the keg. Uh, but uh, I was just uh, interested to see. Uh, if the lower fermentability um, was something I should have expected on the uh, on the front end, uh, I got this on the subject of quick uh, f- uh, quick loggers uh, from Nate in Concord, New Hampshire. Nate says, for a fast logger, I have done a few of them by starting the logger at 50 degrees Fahrenheit for a couple days, then bring it up uh, two degrees a day until uh, till 64 uh, degrees until it's just about finished and then 68 to get it finished all the way and for a diacetyl rest for two or three days. After that, I keg it and uh, let it chill down to 40 degrees and clear with gelatin. I've had pretty good luck turning around a lager in three to four weeks with that method. All of those were using Y-East 2308 Munich lager, and the styles were Pilsner's and Helles. Uh, so I asked Nate uh, whether he lost a lot of beer to the gelatin goo at the bottom of the uh, keg, uh, because uh, I have uh, also clarified with gelatin, and, and you know, that's an inch or two of, of stuff down in the bottom uh, that uh, is basically wasted beer, in my opinion. But, but Nate said um, after the first couple pints or so out of the keg, the beer came out very clear. So um, maybe, that's, uh, maybe that's a way to go. Uh, the other comment, uh, Nate says, Nate says, the other comment is on the high-gravity brew system. I have something very similar to yours that I built last Christmas. One pump, 
240 volt boil coil, but I used a 10 gallon cooler set above the kettle instead of the Bruna bag basket in the kettle. I've tried it a bunch of ways. Rim style, like the high gravity one, batch sparge, using the cooler as the mash tun and pumping the sparge water out of the kettle and into a bucket slash cooler that I then dump into the tun. Fly sparging, pumping the heated sparge water on top of the recirculated mash without disturbing it and then running it off, uh, running off all the liquid. Uh, Nate says, if I didn't already build one, I would be pretty tempted to buy the high gravity system. Oh, there you go. Thanks, Nate. Uh, I, I'm, I'm impressed by people who are handy. And uh, the older I get, the less handy I am, though, which is which was, it's why I'm grateful that our sponsors, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa, built a system for me. I've been getting email uh, asking questions about my high gravity electric brew in a bag system. And uh, one came from listener John, who said he was trying to decide between the high gravity system and two others. Uh, which I will not name, but you've probably seen advertised around. And, and John asked me what I thought of uh, comparing and contrasting the systems. And I basically said that I like the high-gravity system because it's more like brewing with the system that I'm used to brewing with. The other two systems are more like sort of bread machines for beer in a way. And I'm I'm sure that people make excellent beer with them, but you, but you have to assemble a bunch of parts and you you can't reach in and stir the mash while it's recirculating, and and it's just a bit too hands-off for my taste. But the high-gravity system helps you maintain and control the temperature of your mash while giving you access to the process so that you can reach in there, you can stir the mash, you can take gravity readings, you know, just, just like a more traditional system. Also, I said I like the idea of supporting Desiree and Dave, not only because they support us, but because they are homebrewers just like us, and their shop is family-run. When you go in there, into High Gravity in Tulsa, uh, their, their grown-up kids are up in front in the, in the business, and you may see a grandkid or two even running, r- running around the shop, and uh, Desiree may be in the back office uh, running the business side of things, and, and Dave is probably in the shop uh, in the back of the store building these systems. So in the end... I think John was convinced and decided to go with the high-gravity system because of what Desiree replied in an email to him. I I shared uh, John's email uh, with Desiree, and she said, Desiree said, We strive to provide excellent support. If anything goes wrong in the first year, we fix it guaranteed. We even pay the shipping cost to return it to us for repair. Turnaround is usually just a few days plus shipping time. Then she says... After one year, we will still fix it, guaranteed, forever. The only cost is shipping it back to us for repair. So you, you can't beat that. Uh, so there you go. Check out check out all the electric brewing systems from Desiree and Dave at HighGravityBrew.com, and you can get flat rate shipping of $7.99 on ingredients and many other products. That's HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, let's talk to Chris Colby of BeerAndWineJournal.com on brewing tasty triples. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. We're going to talk about a beer style, if we can use that word, in conjunction with uh, with Belgian beers. <laughs> a a beer style that uh, is, is one of my favorites. I, uh, I like it quite a lot. And uh, here in Northwest Arkansas, there's, there's, I've noticed that there's a trend among some of the professional brewers up here to say tripel instead of triple, and I, 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 I want to correct them, and I want to say it's, it's triple. But you know, number one, I don't want to seem like a jerk, and number two, I wasn't sure that I was right. Have you ever heard it pronounced tripel? I always pronounce it tripe l. <laughs> <laughs> Just to be contrary, but, like. Sean Connery on uh, Celebrity Jeopardy. <laughs> no, I, I've always I've always heard triple. Uh, I mean, I've heard some people call it tripel, but I think I don't know. To me, that sounds like what people think it should be, not what it is. It sounds I, like I, they're I, trying I, too hard. It sounds almost affected to me. I it, I think it's tripel, but or triple, but um, <laughs> <laughs> now I've got it. Well, well, yeah. well. What I did was I went back in the archives, and and if you don't have the Basic Brewing app, 
Uh, it's really easy. All I did was I, w- I did the search thing on the app, and I put in monk, the word monk, and two episodes came up. One was Brew Like a Monk with Stan Aronimus, and the other was Drew, Brew as a Monk, which I, I, I did a show with a monk. Uh, I think he was in Hawaii. Uh, and anyway, uh, I listened to enough of the Stan Hieronymus interview to, to know two things. Uh, number one, what a, an awesome interview. He's uh, such a smart guy, and it was obvious that he knew a lot, and, he, and uh, just talking to him about that, uh, you know, the contents of that book was just amazing. And number two, uh, he says uh, triple in that interview. Now, he did say double instead of double. So uh, he says double and triple, and I, up until now, have been saying double and triple, but I'll change one of those. Uh, triples. Now that we've <laughs> now that we've spent a good twenty minutes talking about how to say them, let's talk about how to brew them. Uh, you have written uh, a multi-part uh, multi-part series on beerandwinejournal.com, kind of breaking it down. Uh, well, let's talk about first of all what is a triple. Uh, triple is a, a Belgian style of beer uh, that was it was at least popularized by the West Mall. Trappist Brewery, I'm, I don't think anyone quite knows if it was actually invented by them, but it's basically uh, a strong beer. Uh, triples are pale beers or that, that's sort of become convention that, that doubles are doubles are fairly strong dark beers and triples are stronger uh, pale beers. Um, and most triples are, you know, uh, they're, they're relatively strong beers. Uh, they're highly carbonated. Um, they're they're actually as Belgian beers go. They're fairly highly hopped, although a lot of that it doesn't come off like a like an IPA like hoppiness because of the the strength of the beer. It's you know it's just they're hopped more enough to create a balance. So even though even though they're fairly strong, they're they're very highly attenuated. Um, so the the combination of the the hop rate. And and then being relatively dry, sort of balances the sweetness from from being a a, a heavier beer. And uh, although they, uh, you know, although they can be you know eight to ten percent alcohol, they're they're typically uh, a lot more drinkable than that. They're you know you you think of a lot of uh, eight to ten percent ales, and they're the sort of thing that you sip, and they're you know night big and mouth filling and chewy. And uh, a, a triple is much more. Uh, you know, it's drier. It's the, the high level of carbonation makes it uh, very, very uh, uh, quaffable. I guess is one mm-hmm. phony baloney beer word that people <laughs> use. And uh, yeah, so they're they're essentially a, a strong beer that's dry, fizzy, uh, uh, hoppy enough for balance, and ends up being tasting not so much like a strong beer. So what what sets them apart from Golden Strong Ales? Uh, I don't know an arbitrary decision by somebody to call one. You know, I think the uh, the actual the actual differences between those are very small. Um, I mean, why know, like, why isn't Duval a triple instead of a a Golden Strong Ale? It's because that's how someone decided to categorize it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am not not trying to be flip but i th- i think that's it i mean it's it's a very similar beer and instead of being brewed by monks and called a triple that brewed by secular people and named after the devil so maybe <laughs> they didn't feel like crunching those together but yeah golden Bel- belt and strong goldens are uh you know they're strong beers again they're pale beers they're highly attenuated they're hoppy uh you know i think I think the BJCP attempts to draw a difference by saying that Belgian strong goldens are actually slightly more at- highly attenuated than triples, and you know, who knows? Maybe they even are, but they're they're very very similar beers. And the the, the name triple, as I understand it, and, and as I can dust off my memories of reading uh, Brew Like a Monk. Uh, the the monks brewed like a single, what the, something they called a single, which was their like everyday beer, 
Uh, and then the Dubal was like double the strength or the double the original gravity maybe of the single uh, but was darker. And then the Triple was like triple the original gravity of the single uh, and was uh, gold. And then on the quad, they go back to being dark again uh, and being even stronger than the triple. So that, that's where kind of the, the hierarchy fits in there. Is that right? Is, is that what you recall from, from your learnings? Yeah, it's it's definitely the, the double, triple it, are designations of strength. I think that they're not strictly twice and three times the amount of malt. You know, there's some... Uh, you know, it's it's meant it's meant to hint at that, but it's not exactly that. Um, I was lucky enough to to actually visit the West Mall Brewery, and they had uh, they brewed their their single they called their Extra, which uh, it was not. It's generally only available for people who work at the brewery and the monks there, but they also occasionally served it. And I got some. Uh, they serve it at there's a cafe right across the street from the brewery, and. So that's that's like a Belgian pale ale. Then they had their Dubol, which is a dark, strong beer. Then their triple, and then those are the only three beers they brew. They don't uh, quadruples or uh, quadrua pels, as I pronounce them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not actually sure. I, th- I think those are a fairly modern invention. I, like I don't, I think triple predates quadruple by a long, long time. But I would, <laughs> I suppose, I should figure out if that's true before I say that. But I'm kind of surprised that no American brewer has come up with the quintuple. Yeah, yeah, yeah the yeah. <laughs> the quintuple <laughs> in the race to the top on the extremeness. Um, now, one of my favorite uh, triples, uh, and the one, and, and one of the reasons why it's my favorite is because I can get it, you know, at the little liquor store uh, in Prairie Grove, Arkansas. Here, that's you know within staggering distance of my house is a New Belgium's uh, triple, which is, I believe, around 8.5% alcohol, and they use, a they say, a, a hint of coriander. Now, what's the, what's the tradition on spicing in triples? Generally, they're unspiced, but, uh, you know, as, as with any Belgian beer, they don't really worry too much about, you know, or they don't worry at all about styles and, and conforming to what other people think should be in a beer. They try to make each one individual. Um, generally, the most, you know, the most famous triples from Belgium, most of them are unspiced. Some of them are. Uh, I can't. Give me one second. I think triple caramelite is spiced. Let me just Google that. In listening to the interview with Stan Hieronymus, uh in which he doesn't go into as much detail as we're going to on, you know, brewing this beer, uh, he said, in most examples of Belgian beers in general, uh, the spiciness comes from the characteristic of the yeast and not actually adding spices to it. Um, so, and we can talk about that in a bit when we get to the the yeast part. Um, but, but you know, because of the characteristics of the of the yeast and the and the byproducts, I guess you'd say that they put out during the fermentation process, you might think that there's some spices uh, in Belgian style sometimes, but. Uh, it just may be the yeast fooling your palate. Most uh, triples, uh, you know, including those brewed in Belgium, do not contain spices, but but some may because they just they just don't worry about uh, brewing things, you know, to style. They try to make each beer an individual thing, and uh, you know they'll they'll label it with something indicative of what it is. But if they feel like adding some spices, they will. They're brewing art and ten minutes of pleasure. <laughs> uh, okay, well, well, let's start with the, the the biggest ingredient by volume, and that would be water. Uh, what do we have to worry about or think about as far as uh, water treatments or not? Yeah, you don't you don't need to go nuts with uh, water treatment or, or find an exact you know water profile. Uh, if you if you actually look at the the water that Belgian breweries use, they're sort of all over the map, different breweries, you know, they, they, they get their water from wells or municipal sources and they just sort of adapt to what they, uh, uh, what they have. You know, I, I, I happen to know just cause I toured there, the West Mall brews, they're, they're theirs with hard water, but that doesn't mean you can't brew it with soft water. My, my recommendation would be, uh, if, if you, you know, if you have a spreadsheet where you you know, work on your water profile and change that, 
just ed- any profile that that's going to support brewing a pale beer is good. Uh, you know, I would definitely say get your calcium ions over fifty uh, or over a hundred parts per million. Uh, you'll probably just to keep the uh, the pH down. You want your carbonate ions less than fifty parts per million, and you know, just make it work from there with your magnesium and whatever. Uh, you don't. Uh, even though the beer is relatively hoppy, it doesn't. There's not a lot of late hopping and not a lot of flavor, and, and you don't really, you don't need to bring out the bitterness like you do in a, uh, in an IPA. So you, you don't really need to uh, have a, you know, a chloride to uh, sulfate ratio that's you know heavily skewed towards the sulfates. Uh, if you are adding calcium, I would either add it as calcium chloride or a, or a you know a, a blend of calcium chloride and gypsum. And yeah, basically is I, I would say if you if you can treat your water so that you your mash pH is in the right zone, that that's really all you need. And unless you're unless you're attempting to clone a very specific, you know, triple from a very specific brewery, then you might need to find out about their water. But if you're trying to brew just a triple in general, uh, you've got some pretty wide uh, wide goalposts to get between. A a really simple triple recipe that it just works like gangbusters. It's just plain Pilsner malt as your base malt and a little bit of table sugar. That works great. Um, but that being said, there are other um, you know there are other triples out there like you know triple Carmelite is the, you know they uh, advertise that they're based on three grains and it's like Pilsner malt, oats, and some other pale mm. thing. And you know I'm sure I'm sure there's triples out there with a little bit of wheat in them or you know. Um, but basically, you can brew just a great triple. And in fact, a lot of world-class examples, including West Mall, is basically just Pilsner malt is the only uh, malted grain in there. And then the only other fermentable is table sugar. Um, you, can, you can do some things to mix it up a little bit. Like if you uh, – because <clears throat> Pilsner malt from different uh, maltsters actually – can have different characters. If you if you've tried more than one Pilsner malt and you you think I like this one a little bit and then, but I also like this one, you could try blending two or more Pilsner malts in there. You could also um, you could also swap in a little bit of uh, Vienna malt or Munich malt. These these are are light-ish malts that give a little more maltiness, you know, and, and you could certainly move a little bit of those, you know, swap some swap out a little bit of Pilsner malt and move in a little bit of either Vienna malt or a very little malt of Munich malt. Um, so, you know, you could, you could blend a couple base malts, uh, in your, in your formulation. Uh, one thing you should do though, is stay away from crystal malts or Cara, anything, you know, so many, you know, a lot of homebrew recipes come from people who they, you know, they started brewing English ales and English, Ales sort of by default almost always have crystal malt in them or care of something. And so people started formulating their Belgian recipes and they just carried that over. But in this case, you, you like, you absolutely, you don't want any caramel flavor in this beer. And you don't even want, don't put cara pills or, or anything like that that adds body to the beer because there, there's going to be enough body simply from it being a strong beer. You want to actually make a very fermentable wort. So um, I guess that's a very long way of saying use pilsner malt and table sugar for your recipe <laughs> <laughs> now uh what's our starting gravity going to be and what percentage of table sugar are we going to use to contribute to that how do we figure that out uh you want uh or the bjcp gives the range as as 1.075 to 1.085 uh for uh, specific gravity, original specific gravity. Um, and for the table sugar, at 10 to 20%, something like that, you know, uh, if, you, if you're ambitious, maybe try to bump it up to 30, but, uh, you know, right around 20% would be good. Uh, it's an, enough that the table sugar not only cuts the color a little bit, but mainly makes the beer dry because a certain, you know, certain percentage of the fermentables are completely fermentable and lets the beer ferment down to a, to a slightly lower uh, final gravity. So we don't need to use the fancy, clear uh, Belgian candy syrup 
Uh, table, no. sh- table sugar is not going to give our beer a cidery uh, character? No, just use table sugar. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know. I, I was lucky enough a few years ago to, to tour some breweries in Belgium, and I saw many big sacks labeled sucrose sitting around, but I never saw a sack of any fancy Belgian anything, which doesn't mean <laughs> it's not ever used, but... I think you know. In, in the most case, they're you know they're breweries. They're in it to make money. If they can use sucrose versus something that costs way 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 more, they're going to use sucrose. You know, <laughs> just table sugar. So, uh, and certainly in a in a triple, yeah, you don't you don't need or even want. You know, at least for if you're trying to brew a sort of classic example, the style, you don't really want any other flavors from your sugar i mean if you do if you like that flavor and, and want to brew a triple with that flavor sure go ahead but it's not required since you're brewing with pilsner malt uh typically uh, pilsner malt has a reputation of having a lot of uh, dms precursors since it is lightly kilned uh do we uh do we boil have to boil it more vigorously or boil it longer uh than uh, traditional say two row beers uh, a sixty to ninety minute boil, nice and hard, should do should do the trick. I don't. You, there's no need for a like a super extended boil because you you, given the amount of, you know, it's a big beer, so you need a fair amount of Pilsner malt, but not quite as much as you would for but for a beer of that strength because you're you know twenty percent of it ish, is sugar, so you're you're gonna get a you know when you when you sparge your your grain bed and 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 you know run off the run off the wort and all that, you're going to have, you know, some volume of wort and basically, you know, boil that down to your target volume, uh, however long that takes. And, you know, that's going to be your answer. A good, a good hard boil followed by, uh, you know, swift cooling should, should take care of any, any problems with that. Let's talk about hopping strategy. Yeah, this is really simple. Uh, Basically, use noble hops, or if you if you want to, just any neutral hop variety. Uh, basically, all in the bittering. There's very few triples, at least that I know of, have any any late hops. And um, yeah, it basically you just uh, add enough hops to to balance out the bitterness, and you know you don't. Uh, I mean, you you could if you wanted to, if there was a hop that you has a lot of character and you like that character you could make it but if you're if you're trying to uh if you're trying to emulate a, a sort of belgian style triple uh use noble hops and what kind of ibus are we talking about or what kind of ibu to uh gravity unit ratio are we talking about you say it's it's fairly uh, crisp and bitter uh but you know it's not ipa bitter right it's, it's what it's Belgian bitter, not American West Coast bitter. <laughs> yeah, the the BJCP gives it as twenty to forty IBUs. Okay, twenty would be almost nothing. Uh, I think most, I would guess, most commercial styles are closer to the forty IBUs, which is not, you know, anywhere near as punishing as you know most run of the mill, you know, single IPAs are about sixty. So this is less than that. But then again, most Belgian beers are are low, 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 lower than 40. So, um, yeah, the BJCP gives 20 to 40. I would say stick, stick around 35 to 40 for most of that. Um, and then of course, if you, this is a beer that's kind of finicky, especially when you're getting the fermentation details, right? Take good notes. The first time you brew it, taste it and, and make the adjustment to where, you know, to where you want it. Mm -hmm. But I think your first time through, you're going to be happy. You're going to happy or close to or at the, uh, the high end of the hopping level than than anywhere near the low end. And so far, we've been, we've uh, been setting a fairly neutral stage, but the the character in the play, the character in our triple play, so to speak, <laughs> I didn't mean that one, uh, uh, is the yeast. I mean that's that's what brings the most interesting characteristics uh, to this beer. Right. Yeah. Pilsner malt, and you know, of course, table sugar has almost no flavor and, and noble hops are you know meant to be yeah they've, they've got a flavor or whatever but they're mellow they're not the incredible character characterful hops that you know like american ipas are brewed with 
Um, and so a lot of the uh, the distinctive character, uh, you know, the, the aroma and flavor of a triple comes from the yeast you use. And there are, uh, luckily for us homebrewers, there are a lot of different Belgian strains that work. And really, you know, you could use pretty much any any Belgian strain that produces, you know, there's there's that typical, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a an estuary character along frequently with with the sort of phenolic spiciness, quote unquote, you know, that the Belgian yeasts bring. Anyone that that does something like that will probably work in a triple, although you'll you'll likely have to figure out how it works in a triple. Um, the the yeast I like is is Y yeast thirty seven eighty seven, which is our Trappist high gravity yeast, and uh, that same strain or, or a very similar one is uh, uh, available from White Labs as WLP five thirty, and those those both reputedly came from West Mall. Hmm. Uh, there's also Y yeast twelve fourteen and White Labs WLP five hundred are both supposedly Chimay. So those are both Trappist breweries. They both make triples. So there's you know a good uh, Good strain. Likewise, uh, Y East 1388 and uh, White Labs, uh, I forget the number, but there's, they call it Belgian Gold Ale, are supposedly, you know, the, the Duval strain, which is, again, not a triple, but it's a, a beer almost indistinguishable from a triple. Uh, so, you know, um, those those would work. And, and pretty much any of the... the uh, any of the, the Belgian strains would work, and the, what you basically want is the it's you know it's a strong beer, but you, you ferment it so that the uh, the the character from the yeast you know shows through a little bit, but not like hitting you over the head with a hammer, because it is a, it's it is a dry beer. It is a very drinkable. Uh, it should have so it should have a level of of sort of you know quote unquote Belgian. Uh, characteristics but it shouldn't be and it is can be if, if you let the, the fermentation run too hot it shouldn't be like you know drinking a nail polish headache you know it should be <laughs> yeah it should be something where you you smell it and like oh that's nice not like oh i need to go you know use this to strip the side of my house <laughs> and also you don't want it to be <clears throat> you don't want it to be a hefeweizen yeah uh, you know you, you don't want the you know yeah, that that particular blend of of flavors. You, yeah, you don't want in a in a trip that that bison sort of bubble gum and uh, what's the other one? So the banana, yeah, the banana and the and the bubble gum and the and all those those different uh, clo- and well, clove. And yeah, clove. Yeah, you might, you might want a little bit of clove stuff in there. Uh, a tiny bit of clove wouldn't kill you, but not that particular. You know, this tastes like a heaven bison. But let, let's talk about the mash. Um, okay. You want to uh, mash uh, so that you get a dry beer. You want the the uh, wort to be fermentable. Right. Um, your mash for a uh, a triple can be can be incredibly straightforward if you want it to be. Um, you can uh, just mash in sort of the low end of the normal saccharification range if you want. You know, I would say anything from 146 to 150 uh, Fahrenheit, which would be 63 to 66 Celsius. Okay, that would work. Hold that for 60 to 90 minutes, stir it, and you know that would be a good, a good mash. You know, um, if you're if you're doing a single infusion mash, don't. You know, if you're if you're doing a single infusion mash on a lot of ales, you can cut it short if you want it about 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, but in this case, I'd let it go at least 60 minutes because you know you want the the enzymes to work as much and make a as fermentable a wort as possible. Um, another thing you can do, and probably probably better, would be a simple step mash. Mash in low somewhere, you know, uh, uh, between 140 and 145 Fahrenheit. Um, you know, like 60 degrees Celsius or, or a little bit above that. Let that go for a little while, um, and a little while could be 15 to 30 minutes, and then bump it up to sort of the low, not the lowest part of the saccharification range, but bump it up to like, you know, not not that the exact numbers are, are, but you know, anything in the 150 to 153 Fahrenheit range would probably work pretty well, you know. So you get you start with the low temperature rest, which would would favor beta amylase and would. Uh, 
you know, start working on uh, making a dry beer, and then you you know you bump it up to the low low end of the the main range, and you know just keep stirring it, let that go, you know, sixty minutes again, or again maybe maybe you want it to go a little bit longer, and uh, you know either one of those should do it. the The step match is going to be produce a little bit more fermentable ale. Uh, the, the single infusion match should work. Uh, you know, especially if you're shooting for a slightly higher uh, uh, final gravity, or also if you just, you know, for simplicity, or if your, you know, your setup just doesn't support doing step mashes, those should work. And you know, basically, uh, although you know, step mash is a little bit more complicated than a single infusion mash, but Basically, your work production is pretty straightforward. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't you don't need to do a complicated uh, decoction mash. I mean, if you had the right Pilsner malt, you could try it uh, if you wanted, but you don't need it. And you know, uh, you'll basically end up with you know a kettle full of wort after that, which you can then uh, you know at some point you'll add the sugar to. And uh, another thing I, I would recommend recommend it in the mash of this is get the most out of your you know you're probably going to want to use or not probably you're going to want to use a nice quality triple malt because it's that's going to be very evident as it's you know the only malt in your beer you know uh it's going to be very evident the quality of that and the characteristics use a good malt but also get the most of it like sparge until you've you know until you're right up against that uh wall where you know more sparging would produce too many tannins you know Try to get the most – that will make a nice a nice sort of a quote-unquote grainy touch to the beer. Um, you know, it'll, it'll accentuate the malt a little bit. And, yeah, that's really pretty much it. Just like the uh, the recipe is, is, is not that complicated, the uh, the wort production shouldn't be that complicated. You know, a step mash is about as far as you need to go in, in terms of complications. <clears throat> and, again, <clears throat> since we're using uh... – Pilsner malt, we want to uh, boil vigorously. Um, and at what point do you add and how do you add the sugar? Um, yeah, boil vigorously. One thing I'd also say, because you've got a, a nice uh, low-colored uh, wort, take a look at it and as, as, the, as the, uh, the hot break forms. And if the hot break, if it's in big, you know, big sort of fluffy snowflake-like pieces – then that's exactly what you want. If it if it shows up more as like just like little tiny specks and just makes the wort sort of look you know quote unquote dirty, try adding a little bit more calcium. Like for for a five gallon batch, it's you know half a teaspoon or something like that of calcium chloride or calcium sulfate, and that should that should drop the pH a little bit in the kettle, which will then make the the, the hot hot break look better. And then yeah, basically you want you want to add all that sugar, but you don't you don't want to you know, you're trying to make a light colored beer, so you don't want to pour the sugar in, have it all fall to the bottom of your kettle and scorch and leave yourself with a brown, like scorched tasting ale. So the easiest thing to do is just take if you have a small pot or any sort of any sort of container, put some of the sugar in it, some or all of it, depending on the size, and then just ladle out some wort from your kettle into there and, and swirl it around until it dissolves, and then add it that way. And then also stir again. Uh if you if you dissolve the sugar when you add it there's less of a chance that it'll uh, form form a clump that just sort of falls to the bottom of the kettle and then scorches. And, and of course, a lot of, in any case, a lot of stirring when you add that is going to be a good, good thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, we, we said we were going to talk about fermentation, uh, the probably yep. the, the most important part. Uh, so what are the guidelines? I mean, what are we looking at? Yeah, the thing is... As we've mentioned, like at least three times now, so it's a simple, <laughs> simple recipe, simple wort production. Uh, in order, in order for the beer, you know, not to be a just stultifyingly simple, boring beer, there's got to be some character, and this character comes from the yeast, and particularly how you handle the fermentation. And it, it's kind of, uh, it's interesting. For at least two reasons. One is that when you when you normally ferment a high gravity ale, 
you know, your normal approach would be to pitch a lot of yeast, aerate very well, and, you know, control the fermentation temperature. Uh, you know, and all these things would lead to, you know, an ordered fermentation that, that would work well and the yeast wouldn't, you know, stall or, or get stuck. Okay, but all these things also, you know, higher pitching rates and higher aeration levels and, and lower temperatures also, they cut down on the, the sort of yeast characteristics that the yeast kick off. And you want some of those in a, in a triple. You know, again, not, you know, you don't want your, your beer to be uh, what I call a nail polish headache. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want that, but you, uh, you know, you want there to be some character. So you sort of got to thread the line. And you, here's the thing, as, as a brewer, you can manipulate any of those variables. If you wanted to pitch a lot of yeast but try to aerate less and ferment warm, you could try that. If you wanted to, you know, try to pitch a smaller amount of yeast but aerate well and ferment cool, you could try that. You know, they're all, they're all three, you know, like sliders on a control panel that will change your beer somehow, and they all interact. I the way I like to do it is uh, limit the pitching rate a little bit, like pitch between, you know, look up what the what the optimal would be, uh, you know, you using one of the standard pitching rate calculators, uh, and lower the, the pitching rate from from what they say you should do by about half to maybe three quarters. Hmm. So it's, it's slightly at half. You're basically the yeast are going to have to replicate once to reach the optimal pitching rate okay so it's it seems you know sometimes if you say slightly and then say cut it by half people you know <laughs> well, uh, which one but uh in that you got to understand it's doubling so pit, lowering it by half is to some way of thinking slightly uh so half to three quarters that'll make the yeast you know they'll have to go an extra round of uh of replication uh to get up to their uh the normal strength they would, and that would help. That'll help them produce some of the flavors you want. I would always, though, aerate well. I, I wouldn't try to limit the aeration to, although that does result in more yeast drive characters. I think you know you've got a big beer here. You treat the yeast you put in it well by aerating well, and then um, you know to get the right level, it's just a question of finding the right temperature and. You know, you could either, depending on the strain, you could either do that by just uh, experimenting, trying to find a temperature, or look up what other people have done. But what a lot of people do on a lot of these Belgian beers that works well is you, is you start out fermenting relatively cool, and then at the end, you let the temperature rise. Mm-hmm. And this will give you usually the amount of, uh, a lot of times will give you an amount of, yeast character that's nice but not overpowering if you if you start fermenting warm especially when the yeast are uh you know if you've under pitched and the under pitched and the yeast are, are still replicating and growing in numbers uh if you start fermenting warm you can get beers with like very blown out estuary characteristics and, and phenolic characteristics and you don't want that so fermenting cool starting in the mid 60s or even for some some of these beers in the low 60s at, but then let when the fermentation starts to, uh, you know, starts to slow down noticeably, start letting the temperature rise, and you know you can let it rise up into the low 70s, or in some cases in the mid 70s. It's just you really, I mean, all these Belgian strains, which have the most, the widest variety of you know sort of yeasty, interesting characters, also tend to be the twitchiest yeasts in that the little changes in in uh, variables tend to lead to, you know, larger changes. So you've really, you've really got to, uh, you know, you've really got to experiment for yourself mm-hmm. to, to hit, you know, especially if you're trying to hit a very narrow range of like a very specific kind of triple. You can, you know, you can read a recipe and follow what someone else did and, and probably get, you know, a, an adequate beer out of it, you know, one that will the, be drinkable and, and will encourage you to try the beer again. But if you're really trying to hone in on, you know, either making a clone of a specific one or, or making one just to your satisfaction, you're going to have to, uh, you know, you're going to have to twiddle with the variables. Because, you know, I know a lot of people, for example, obsess about the, t- the temperature range and they'll look up what uh, what the, you know, the brewery in Belgium, uh, Belgium 
brews that you know that beer and try to replicate that. And a lot of times it doesn't work because unless you unless you're also replicating exactly what their level of variation is, and you know if as long as as you're even, you know you have to know when to start the 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 rise because if you you start letting the temperature rise earlier you're going to get more yeast characters characteristics if you <coughs> if you wait and let it rise later that that's going to be less and so it, it's you know. Um, and also, they're, I mean, even down to the, the point that they're using different equipment in, on some of these yeasts has, mm. has an effect. So you've really got to treat these yeast. I mean, I, I would argue, sorry, that you need to treat all yeast strains individually, but especially the, the, the Bel, you know, quote unquote, Belgian y uh, flavorful yeast strains. You've got to treat them, uh, you know, individually, get your, you know, Brew, brew with it once. Try to try to find some recommendation on using that that yeast strain. Like you know, up for I I give my favorite profile on on the website for for using the the Trappist. And you know, start there and then start tweaking it for yourself because it's gonna it's gonna come out. Even I mean, even if you followed as closely as possible an established recipe, your beer is gonna turn out different than the person who brewed it. And you know, uh, which I, you know, I'm not saying to sun defeatist and like you can't do it but it's just you you've got to you know if you want to finally replicate something with one of these yeast strains you've got to be really you know you take good notes you got to know what what the inputs are and and you've got to uh experiment on your own on your own system and you know uh, i mean the nice thing about that is it's not it's not brain surgery either you know there's there's three big variables and if you you know if you know how to work uh a thermometer, and if you're basically aerating to saturation every time, uh, you know, then you can figure out uh, the pitching rate. And then, you know, if you're if you're always aerating fully, then you're really down to only two variables: just, uh, you know, the the pitching rate and and the the curve of your your fermentation temperature. No, and no. you know, it, it it can be a nice uh, it's a nice reward if you if you go through a couple iterations, you know, maybe Bruce a beer that first is like, oh, this is drinkable, and the second one you tweak it, and hey, this is good, and the third one is like, this is what I wanted to brew. Mm-hmm. You know, that can be uh, a very very nice moment in uh, you know your brewing life. So, so keep anyway, good notes. yeah, take good notes and just recognize that. Another thing to recognize is these, the, you know, these yeasts are finicky that a little changes will. But there's also if you if you try a lot of triples, there's a lot of variation out there too. There's there's some that have, you know, there is a decent amount of like banana in them, and they're and they're they do have a lot a lot of the yeast character. There's some that are there, uh, you know, some that are closer to being neutral, you know, with which is like a hint of that sort of you know quote unquote Belgian character. Um, so. Yeah, you know, you if you brew it once, no matter where you land, if it, if it's drinkable, you know, there's probably a, a triple out there that's something like that. So you haven't failed, you know. <laughs> you just you might have produced a beer that's not exactly what you wanted, but you know, it's it's a, a beer like this. If you want to brew it well, it's it's going to be more than just looking up a recipe and following it once. So you're going to have to you're going to have at least one round of tweaking. You know, take good notes. Uh, you know, take good notes on your temperature, take good notes on, you know, especially on your fermentation, like how long, how many days did it go before you started the, the fermentation rise? And, oh, ooh, one last thing about the fermentation rise at the end. Um, that, that's also going to help you hit your final gravity. Um, and some of these yeasts, so not the, not the particular, not why yeast 3787, but... Some of these yeasts uh, uh, tend to uh, takes them a long time to finish. You know, you'll you'll rip through the beginning part of the fermentation and think, "Ooh, this is going well," and then they'll just sort of, you know, uh, maybe not not stick, but but they'll sort of slow down and chug and chug and chug. So, uh, depending on the yeast you use, even with a temperature rise, you need, you need to. You need to expect that you might be sitting sitting there waiting for the, the fermentation to finish for a while, mm-hmm. and that's and that's fine. Um, that's just some of the yeast, uh, you know, and especially this is a big beer, so you know sometimes it gets down to the end and they gotta 
that they're working pretty hard and they're you know at the end of a long fermentation it's just going to take them a while so just keep the keep the temperature up uh don't mess with the beer otherwise like don't i wouldn't try to certainly don't aerate near the end to try to help it out because you'll just have make a diastole bomb um I, you know i wouldn't try to add yeast nutrients late because you're just setting yourself up for problems just that's uh if the the fermentation slows down. Really, the only thing you can do is just make sure that you're keeping the temperature up, and then just let it. You know, it's just going to take time. And then packaging. Uh, you are not recommending kegging. Yeah, kegging. I mean, here's the thing: a standard corny keg. In order, it would it would easily take the amount of pressure that it it requires to get the you know uh, amount of uh, you know, volumes of CO2 that you want, but then you've got, you know, your, if you've got a standard size, like, like hose, then it's just going to be shooting out of your, your tap, like a, like a fire hose, you know, cause, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's supposed to be, uh, it's supposed to be carbonated, you know, to, uh, you know, to at least roughly the, uh, roughly the level of champagne, you know, it's, it's supposed to be very bubbly. So it's best to, uh, you know, if you're, if you're brewing a triple, you're probably a fan of triple and hopefully you'll have some of those, those big, heavy Belgian style bottles around now, your target is somewhere around four volumes of CO2, which, it, which is quite high. It's less than champagne. Champagne's maybe five to six. Uh, but four is pretty high. Uh, when you consider like, uh, American, American beers, which are which are relatively fizzy are you know maybe two point five to two point six. Mm. So mm. jumping to four, it's it's that's fairly highly carbonated, and um, you can if your if your bottles aren't as thick as maybe you want, you can maybe dial that down to three, so that you know you, you don't set yourself up for problems. But if you have the nice thick bottles, uh, shoot for about four volumes of CO two, and um, you know package them in heavy bottles. And, you know, if any of, if, if you don't have enough heavy bottles to get all of it, you probably want to, you know, put those, the lightly packaged bottles, like in a, in a heavy garbage bag or something. So if one of them does, <laughs> does pop or shatter, which doesn't happen frequently, uh, but it can, uh, you know, then the, then the mess is contained. Uh, but really used, if, if you just, if you just use heavy bottles, uh, that, that should save it. And if, you know, if you really want to go nuts, you can get those, those, you know, uh, big heavy Belgian bottles with the, and get a, you know, a corker in the cage and all that. And th those will easily withstand the pressure. And those also look, you know, they, they, you you're going to be putting a lot of effort into this beer, you know, packaging it in a 750 mil bottle like that just sort of looks cool. Mm -hmm. And, uh, although, you know, you only need the special corker and all that, but that, you know, it looks neat. And also they're, a lot of Belgian breweries release their uh, some of their triple in that format. So, uh, some some champagne bottles, some cheap champagne bottles, uh, you can cap. Uh, I've discovered, which is uh, nice for sparkling meat as well. So, yeah. Well, this uh, it sounds like fun. Uh, it uh, you know, of course, we're going into going into the cooler months. Uh, but there's still probably enough heat around so that uh, you know we can we can pull off a, a good fermentation of, of a Belgian beer before the the fall. Um, oh yeah, because especially because the the fermentation itself is going to be generating some heat. Mm -hmm. So you know when it's when it starts to slow down, it's still you know if you just quit controlling the temperature, it'll get up there. Well, I I think that I'll, I want to go back to the drawing board and get more simple in my Belgian uh, style or Belgian inspired recipes. And and this uh, the series of articles is a really good uh, stepping off point. And uh, and it it's made made me thirsty. So because so hmm. good job, Chris. Thanks. Yeah, I really <laughs> I, triple is is a beer style I really like. Um, and. I mean, one thing I think for a lot of homebrewers, especially you know, if you've if you've sort of mastered uh, English ales, or even if you've gone over to to you know German style lagers and brewed that, trying trying a Belgian adds you know adds some new tools to your your toolbox as a brewer. You know, monkeying with the the fermentation details stuff. It's it's just a little bit. It can be a beer if you're you know if you're 
sort of done all the, you know, single infusion mash, add a bunch of hops, you know, make your IPA. If you're, you know, if you've done that and you're trying, you're like, well, what else is out there? A triple is a great, uh, a great style to try your hands at because it's, it's enough. It's complicated enough that it's challenging, but it, again, it's not brain surgery. It's not, you know, if you expend a reasonable amount of effort, you'll, you're going to produce something that you really like. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, James. Well, thanks again to Chris. Check out his series of articles on triples on beerandwinejournal.com. Chris continues to provide excellent brewing information on that site. If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com, or please don't uh, don't forget to or just hello, or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com, and please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You can get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo, and you can check out our basic brewing shirts in the store as well you can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our dvds on basicbrewing.com and if there isn't a vendor in your area you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our amazon.com link we greatly appreciate the support there our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are not your mother's clean freak refreshing dry shampoo and creative haven creative cats coloring book Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. And don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on basicbrewing.com. That's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer, production help for Basic Brewing Radio, and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson, Basic Brewing Radio, is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.